Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Nils. Hello, everybody. It's really nice to be here today in the CSS Cafe. And I would like to talk to you about why I think we need CSS speech. Now, if you're thinking, fine, but what is CSS speech? I can tell you that it's probably the oldest CSS and maybe the most interesting CSS module you probably haven't ever heard of. But before I explain why we need CSS speech, I want to take a moment to think about why we need design in general, because I think it's important. So why do we design things? Well, we design them because of innovation. We want to innovate and change and improve things, improve the way they look, improve the way they feel. If we take this chair as an example, it's called the tulip. Uh, it was developed, uh, I believe, in the 1950s or 1960s uh, by Aaron Saarinen. And he wanted to create a chair that did two things. One, it's created out of a single piece of molded plastic that was pretty much unheard of at the time. And he also wasn't a great believer in chairs having four legs like they traditionally do. So he came up with this and you know, it looks brilliant. It looks amazing. I'm not too sure how comfortable it would be, but it was a real innovation in something as common and everyday as a chair. Then we design for recognition. If we think about a different kind of chair, a throne, historically, these have always been designed to be very grand, very ostentatious, very ambitious, lots of glittering gold and jewels and all these kind of things on it. And the reason is for recognition. The people who sit in them didn't always look terribly exciting or particularly important. So they wanted ways to make it clear to everybody, make it easy for people to recognize that they were a person of importance, the king or the queen, for example. So again, a chair in a different form is designed for the purpose of recognizing somebody or something. And then we design for experience. So another kind of chair. This one designed by Arn Jakobsen, it's called the egg, unsurprisingly, and it thinks about the experience of sitting in a chair. Normally, when we sit in a chair, it's because, like me now, I'm sitting at my desk and I'm openly with my laptop. Uh, maybe we're sitting around a table eating with friends or family, or we're sitting in comfy chairs around a coffee table or a fire and talking to people. This chair takes a different experience. It asks the question, what if you want to sit in a chair that cocoons you from the rest of the world, lets you hide yourself away a little bit, feel a little bit insulated and protected from what's going on around you. So this is design thinking about the experience of sitting in a chair. So if we take this to the digital age, why do we design things on the web? Well, again, for pretty much the same reason. On screen, there's a picture of the very first website running in an early browser on Tim Berners-Lee's next computer. Now, this is awesome, of course, it's the first website and look, you know, what we've achieved since then. But visually, in terms of design, it's really not that much to sing about. So we, we wanted to innovate and we did so by introducing HTML elements in the early days that let us change fonts, center things, even make them blink. Although thankfully we've got rid of that idea for the most part. And then of course, along came CSS and we could do all sorts of things to change the visual design and make them more exciting in terms of web pages. It started off with kind of underlines and then it got to page layouts. And now we have all sorts of things from Flexbox to container queries and many more things in CSS. So we innovated uh, design on the web. And then we also design for recognition, digitally speaking. Uh, if I were to ask you to look at the purple rectangular shape on the screen now and think of a chocolate bar, you'd probably be thinking of Cadbury's. If you look at the red cylinder and think of a soft drink, I bet you're thinking of Coca-Cola. This is design in its most pure and elemental form. Two colors that instantly make you think of a brand and everything that goes with it. And these colors are everywhere. They're in their billboards, their magazine advertising, and of course their websites and, and all their digital advertising. So again, we see design for the purpose of recognition on the web too. And then of course there's design for experience. 
And experience when it comes to design doesn't necessarily always come in the ways that you think it will. The picture on screen is the homepage of the gov.uk website from about 2012, about six months after it was launched. And later that year, it won a very prestigious British Design of the Year Award. This is remarkable for two reasons. One, typically that award is won by fashion designers, architects, um, you know, conventional artists and the like. It was never before won by a digital product. The other reason it's interesting is because it's not actually a wonderful visual design. It's incredibly simple. It's actually pretty plain and not terribly exciting. But the reason it won the design is because its design completely fit its purpose. When you come to the government website, you're not there to be entertained. You're there because you want to pay a parking ticket or pay your taxes or find out about your travel visa requirements. Uh, they're necessary things and you just want to focus on the job and succeed at getting it done. And so it won this award because the design made that experience possible. So we come on to voices because after all, I am going to be telling you more about CSS speech. So why do we choose voices for things? Well, again, we can think about innovation. One of the most widespread and commonly owned voice interfaces is the Amazon Echo. They really were the first to make it a, an everyday interaction that we were speaking with technology that would also speak back to us. And they chose the voices very, very carefully. So if you happen to have an Echo device and you use English as your primary language, this is how it will sound to you. Hello, I'm Alexa, and this is how I sound in India. This is how I sound in America. And this is me in Canada. Here I am in Australia. And this is me in the United Kingdom. So we saw huge innovation from Amazon. And as part of that innovation, they understood that uh, the way a voice sounds is an important part of connecting with your audience. Just the simple matter of having a voice that sounds like you uh, can make an enormous difference. And they've done that you know, pretty well across the, the whole board of the, of the range of Echo devices. So choosing a voice and giving it character is really an important part of the whole idea of interface and voice design. Uh, and then we have uh, design and voice choice for recognition. I'm going to play you the audio from an infamous commercial from British television in the 1990s. Uh, the store is Marks and Spencer, and this was for their Christmas food range of products. But just listen to the voice and the way it sounds. Traditionally cured Scottish gravel like salmon with creamy mustard and dill sauce. Hand prepared turkey with braven apple and sage stuffing wrapped in maple cured bacon. Lincolnshire red cabbage with apple and cranberries slow braised in red wine and tawny port sauce. Golden roast parsnips coated with wildflower honey and whole grain mustard dressing. Connoisseur Christmas pudding packed with plump sultanas and steeped in Cavossier cognac. This is not just Christmas food. This is M&S Christmas food. So, yeah, food porn 101, um, but all based around the voice. 20 odd years later, people are still talking about that advert. It had an extraordinary impact just because of the voice, the words that were chosen, and of course, the way they were spoken. So choosing that for recognition, you know, that brand, that, that department store, you know, they will be known for this advert for, for many decades to come, I suspect. They couldn't have asked for better brand recognition through the voice and the actor that they chose. And then we can choose voices for recognition. In a world where cat videos and memes rule the feeds. Okay, Red, that was great. Thank you. You got it? Yeah, that was great. Cool. You, you can stop speaking like that now, though. What do you mean? This is how I always speak. Okay, cut. <laughs> so that is a person who goes by the very cheerful name of Red Pepper. And he really does speak pretty much like that. Um, but... Who didn't think in that just first one or two words, all those memories of watching movie trailers, um, 
this person voiced uh, the trailers in the UK, at least for Space Jam, for Men in Black. You know, when you hear that voice, you're going to get an action movie. It's going to have some action movie hero in it. There's probably going to be some comedy and a lot of explosions and it's going to be great. But that all happens because the voice is just so instantly recognizable. It kicks off that experience the very minute you hear it, you know what you're going to get and you're pretty much going to have a rollicking good time while you're at it. All of which brings us on to the question of the day. So why do we need CSS speech? Well, for one thing, because we don't have a way to do voice design in the browser. We've got lots of ways of generating voices. Uh, indeed, there are many ways of doing voice design outside of the browser, but inside the browser, not so much. So we want to innovate. This is already happening. Most web browsers now, except for Chrome, have a web reader of one description or another. We've come to realize that sometimes it's much more convenient or much more pleasurable to listen to a web page being spoken to you than it is to sit in front of your machine and, and actually have to look at it. So if we take uh, an example of the beginning of a blog post on my website in the Firefox web reader, you can listen to it like this. Tink.uk. Why we need CSS speech. Tink. Leonie Watson. Five, six minutes. In these times when almost every device and platform is capable of talking to you, you may be surprised to learn that there is no way for authors to design the oral presentation of web content, in the way they can design the visual presentation. Now, it's useful, but there's much more we could do to innovate. That's an okay synthetic speech voice, but it's pretty bland. You can change it, but only within the limitations of, of what you have available in your browser. You can speed it up some, you can slow it down, but there was no change. There was no alteration in the cadence. There was no bits that were a little bit louder because it's more exciting or a little bit more quiet because it wasn't quite so important. It's just kind of nothing very much to it. If we had CSS speech, we'd be able to change that exactly the way that we use CSS properties that you all know very, very well to design the visual content, we could also do the same. And we could add in pauses, volume changes, pitch or rate changes to make you know, the content much more exciting. In other words, there's a huge open world out there where we could innovate more with interface design for voice on the browser and have some fun with some more CSS speech while we were at it. We also do it for recognition. So what if that same web reader sounded like this? Why you need CSS speech in these times when almost every device and platform is capable of talking to you, you may be surprised to learn that there is no way for authors to design the oral presentation of web content in the way they can design the visual presentation of web content in the way they can design a visual presentation. Now that is a clone, apparently, of my voice. Thank you to the very generous people at play.ht. They actually have some amazing AI voice generation and cloning text-to-speech capability over there. I seem to have acquired a slightly American accent in there, uh, a fact for which I have yet to uh, discover the reason why. Uh, but if I was of a mind to, and to be clear with you, I'm really not, I could, with CSS speech, get it to use my own voice. There's an API for this text-to-speech engine. So if you came to my website to read one of my blog posts, in theory, you could listen to me read it. Really, though, I'm not suggesting it. I just kind of want to make the point that these things are possible. And if you think about major brands out there, the advertising actors that they choose for their voiceovers, what's to say that they wouldn't choose to do the same with the content on their websites? And then we come to experience. And, uh, you know, here we can think about something slightly different. Some of the concerns that are raised about why we might not want CSS speech. And these come from a number of screen reader users, people like myself. The reason people are worried about this is they're concerned that if we let everybody loose on the voice experience of web content, i.e. we let them design and change the way our screen readers sound, we're opening ourselves up for a big world of pain. 
because let's face it, uh, things are not always easy to read or to see on the web. Uh, we know that accessibility is still a big challenge across the web. So the argument goes, are we not just opening up another kind of avenue for everybody to, well, screw it up, basically. I actually don't think this is the case. The reason, well, actually two reasons. One reason is that if we think about devices like the uh, Google Assistant or um, the Amazon Echo, there's a speech synthesis markup language that they use, and in fact, which most text-to-speech engines out there, the ones from Google, Microsoft, all use. And SSML has many of the same properties as CSS speech. It's not supported in the browser, but we haven't seen a whole range of apps and skills on home assistant devices that we can't understand. Uh, people actually, it seems, are pretty good at designing intelligible voice interfaces. So I don't think there's much evidence out there to suggest that designers, developers are going to run riot all over the voice experience. The other reason I'm not too concerned is that the CSS speech module as it stands has fail safes built into it. So you can make speech a little louder or a bit louder still or higher or fast or a bit faster, but it's all relative to the settings the voice person has got already. So whatever my volume settings are, CSS speech could make it louder or a bit more loud, faster or a bit faster, slower or a bit more fast, uh, slow. So it's all relative. In other words, there are no real extremes. You can't suddenly ratchet up the volume to something that would be really painful to listen to or speed it up so fast that nobody could understand it. Having said that, I listen to my screen reader at about 560 words a minute when the average speaking rate is about 150 words a minute. So I think people would have to go some to outpace most screen reader users out there. But like I say, I don't think there's much to worry about. What I do think is that the experience could be changed so much. Here's my screen reader reading a very theoretical news item. News headline, nothing happened, reported on April 1st. Nothing happened today. Everybody went and had a nice cup of tea instead. And there you have it. Again, a bit like the web reader. It's kind of bland. It's not very interesting. You could be reading about kittens in trees. You could be reading about somebody's romance and it all sounds exactly the same. But if we were to play that same sample again with help from what CSS speech could do for it, you can just pick it up a little and make it a little bit more exciting. Heading level two. News headline, nothing happened. Reported on April 1st. Nothing happened today. Everybody went and had a nice cup of tea instead. So just raising the pitch on the headline so it popped a bit more, speeding up the date because nah, that's kind of meta information. A bit like they do on the radio when they're, they're reading out the terms and conditions, certainly here with UK advertising anyway. And then a normal speech cadence and pace for the text of the news headline itself or the news article itself. So I think it's all about small and subtle changes, not the extremes that a lot of people are worried about. So uh, here's a bit more about CSS speech. If you are curious, uh, we can innovate with it. Um, here is a short video of a prototype that uh, I created with enormous help from uh, a wonderful person called Stuart Langridge, uh, who put this version together. Uh, I'll show you the link uh, in a bit, but it's actually editable, so you can go and play with it for yourself. But this is just a very simple uh, demonstration of some of the things that CSS speech could do. This sounds normal. This sounds loud. This sounds quiet. This sounds fast. This sounds slow. This sounds high. This sounds low. This specifies a voice family. So that actually uses the web speech API uh, to create the proof of concept or the, the, the polyfill prototype. Um, but again, like SSML, it has pretty much the same properties, the same capabilities that CSS speech would give us only, of course, with web speech, it's a JavaScript API. So you kind of need to do a lot of the hard work yourself instead of leaving it to the browser. But again, you get that idea that none of those changes in the voice style were particularly extreme or even really very, very disruptive. 
Um, so again, I hope that sort of starts to underline the kind of reassurance that I don't think CSS speech is going to cause us too many problems. And then there is recognition. Um, one of the reasons I like the idea of CSS speech is that it's familiar. We recognize it because it's CSS. It's just like the stuff we've been doing for what, 25 years now. Um, so on screen, there's just, you know, some very, very simple um, conventional CSS. And in the other side of the screen, there's some counterpart uh, CSS speech properties. As we have font family for choosing a cascade of font styles, voice family will let you do the same uh, where we might choose you know foreground and background colors we can choose the volume the pitch or the rate but the properties are astonishingly familiar and i'm a great believer in familiarity and, and recognition uh, not having to learn a new technology a new platform another language whatever you want to call it that makes sense to me let's keep it within the bounds of what we're already doing uh, and then there's experience. So if we go back to the web reader and back to that blog post, don't worry, I'm not going to um, make you listen to, to that clone of my voice anymore. But um, this actually uses uh, the Google uh, TTS API, again, to simulate some of the effects that we could achieve if we had CSS speech available in the browser. Why we need CSS speech. In these times, when almost every device and platform is capable of talking to you, you may be surprised to learn that there is no way for authors to design the oral presentation of web content in the way they can design the visual presentation. So we open up a huge range of possibilities of voice, of voice quality, and we can style it there. So we can put emphasis on words uh, in these days when every technology, um, we can again make the, he the headline just sound a little bit more bold, a little bit brighter all these little subtle changes that just make the entire experience of listening to content, whether you use a screen reader or a web reader, that much more rich and engaging. So if you're curious to find some more information, you can go and have a look at the CSS speech mod, uh, specification itself. I did say this was the oldest uh, CSS module you've probably never heard of. It's actually been around since about 2001. It was originally proposed as the oral style sheets. Um, it was implemented at the time in Emacs Speak, and actually I have recently discovered that somebody else has re-implemented CSS Speech in its entirety in Emacs Speak uh, now. So we do actually have one implementation, which is really good news. I think there's a ton of stuff in that spec that needs clearing up, and if I can get enough interest from the community, uh, and if that drives browser implementer interest enough, then that's going to be first thing on my agenda. Uh, I wrote a couple of blog posts about this, uh, one on why I think we need it, which is essentially what I've been sharing with you today. The other talks in more detail about some of the concerns that I discussed. If you think CSS speech will be a good thing to have in a browser, I have one small favor to ask of you all. Please go to that first blog post, the why we need CSS speech, and add a comment in the bottom just to add your voice to those that are already there expressing an interest and, and a desire for this. Browser implementers at the moment are convinced that there isn't really any interest in this. Um, and until I can convince them otherwise, um, we're in a bit of a stalemate. So I am on a, well, originally it was a one woman campaign to do this, but it turns out that quite a lot of other people think this would be a good idea too. So if you're one of them, I'd really welcome your help in, in making our voices heard with the browser implementers. Uh, if you want to go and play with that polyfill demo, the URL is on screen now. As I say, huge thanks to Stuart Langridge for helping turn my perfectly dreadful JavaScript into something fit for public consumption. But you can go and play around with it. You can even edit the CSS there and, and kind of play around with it with yourselves. It's a really nice, nice little gizmo to play around with. Uh, and finally, if you have a couple of seconds, head over to this site and um, add your voice availability profile to the database. One of the interesting challenges we'll have when we get to use CSS speech is the voice family. Uh, nowhere is it particularly well documented uh, which voices are common across different browsers and different platforms. 
So in the way that we might typically choose, you know, two or three different fonts in the font family to make sure that we got something that looked right across a bunch of different uh, browsers and platforms. It's really hard to do that with the, uh, the voice family at the moment because we don't know which voices are consistently available across the board. So Stuart, again, help me put this together. We're, we're busy collecting um, all the voices uh, and, and what we're gonna do at the end is do some analysis on that and see if we can come out with a, a constant or a consistent set of voices that will make that voice family property much more usable by everybody. And so that's me, thank you. I hope that's shared with you why I think we need CSS speech. <laughs>